longer and darker and less light coming in from the outside. Most books up to 95% that are sold in, the, in America are British books or American books, of course, and the rest 5%. Half of it is French or German. And then you have maybe one or two books uh, from, from other countries. It's a little bit changing, hopefully, uh, now, but still. Um, and as we always say, uh, no respectable musicians would just listen to music from one country. They see actually global music, world music is of significance. It's a very big movement and it's inspirational and the same has to be and should be for theater to know um, about different realities we all live in in this planet and perhaps th that we are not fully aware and do not always understand and hear and uh, think about uh, these other ways of uh, working and living and uh, trying to create meaning of life uh, is part, part of the problems we also do have. And um, so we are making our contribution with this and we invited for the first time one theater. Traditionally, we have playwrights from all over the world, from uh, Australia, from uh, uh, Africa, North Africa, Arab world, Indonesia, Australia, uh, Latin America, minority countries, minority languages often. We support great, great writers who are very well known in their countries but will never ever have a production in the US and most of the time even might not even get a reading and it has been very successful. But the work of the Gorky Theater is so unique and so important that we felt we feature them. It's an ensemble of actors and directors and writers that was created in 1915 by Sherman Langhoff and Jens Hilge with the okay from the Berlin mayor and the entire ensemble and everybody in the creative role the people who don't look like me. They are all migrants, um, whether they chose to come to Berlin because of work or whether they were really had to be refugees um, or were first generation uh, uh, children of uh, immigrants. And uh, they are uh, now have a place, as they call a safe haven, to create work about the migrant uh, experience, but also of LGBT, uh, gender, uh, feminist, uh, uh, global capitalist uh, uh, problems, as they would say. Um, and they're having a little utopia. It's a beautiful theater. I think you all should go. It's a little temple. It's actually modeled after a Greek temple. Mm -hmm. And um, as the philosopher Heidegger said, uh, if you just look at a photo of a temple, it doesn't mean anything. You see a ruin of a temple, it really doesn't mean anything. But at the time when a temple was working, when you know, the gods were there, when the people would come to have their rituals of life, the births and the funerals and the celebrations or ordinations, when they would go for services. That was when the temple was shining, and you know, when it was brilliant, bedazzling, and gave a, a, a meaning and a center to, to, to the local community or the community in general. And I think the Gorky in some way right now is a working little temple of theater and, uh, and not always one captures uh, such, a, uh, such a feat. And they also is coming to an end. Uh, Shermin Langhoff is leaving, I think, this year, the Gorky, and we thought it was really worth celebrating they also have a very unique way of working together. Actors and writers are together in the room. Actors say what they would like to say or not. Would they rewrite a monologue or not? They put one in and up to the nine weeks of rehearsal till the very end, till the night of the opening, things could be changed. Nothing new for ensemble theaters, for off-off work, which we all love and know, but to do this in a very big state theater or city theater is highly unusual. It's never been done before. Not only that you would never see the stories like the one we had in the afternoon about a Turkish immigrant whose father was a leftist revolutionary who was part of a militia and the Turkey had to flee, came back, went back in the underground and the son has never met his father. So this was the story from before. We didn't see these stories about Turkish people are from Turkish people ever on the stage. So it's a big change that happened and we are really we're honored to collaborate with the Gorky. They, most of them did leave, Dimitri is still here. So it was a great honor. I think it was a very successful series and thank you all for coming, especially those who came more often. I am Frank Hensker <coughs> from the Siegel <coughs> Theater Center here at the Grad Center CUNY and our center <coughs> reaches academia and professional theater international and American theater and this is right at the very, very heart of what we do. And we're very proud to be collaborating with Penn for over 10 years. If you have a cell phone, now it's getting uh, uh, more serious. I'm gonna turn it off. Actually, the last show I turned it on, even though it was off, and then it rang. Uh, as the only one, <laughs> it was a very sad fact, but um, now we're going to start. The play is directed by our very own Andy Goldberg, a great director and also a PhD student here, and uh, Anna Crivelli is uh, the actor. 
who uh, will be uh, engaging with the work um, of um, Sibyl Berg, one of the stars of German theater, of the German writers, also a commentator for the Spiegel magazine since uh, years. And um, we are now going to see a, a version of And Now the World, or the so-called outside, means nothing to me. Thank you. Hard, so I know what counts, what matters. And then the world will get its answer fast, which is, this is me. I'm going to last. I'm going to win, use all my power, stay untouched, not debased, not concerned, cut down small. I'm going to reinforce my body. Good night and fuck you all. <laughs> I would say I'm quite impressed by the way I can rhyme stuff <laughs> and keep promises. I'm going to show you the world, the world of normal people, you know, people with hope. And you are going to keep quiet. That was the deal. It's only with hope that people can actually stand their lives. How are you anyway? I don't know why I thought of that. Are you hoping to see the sun again? I, and that's who interests me most here, don't think there's much point in that. Oh well. My hope, not that you asked, is for someone to be waiting outside for me. They could easily wait for me, one of those young people, most of them are unemployed anyway, <laughs> or they're studying to be unemployed later, or they're doing an internship, a 10 year one. So I don't see why it should be a problem for someone to <coughs> hang around out there waiting for me. A young woman with green eyes and an interest in Kung Fu. <laughs> Let's call her Lena. This person might be standing at her window right now, looking up at where the sky used to be before this constant rain started, wondering whether there can ever be any feeling except pain when you're in love. It always hurts in the end, because one of you wants it and the other one doesn't, or one of you doesn't want it anymore, or both of you don't want it enough, and then you just sit staring at each other Vaguely surprised. Ooh, buzzing. The spy drones are circling outside the window again. It's the new teenage boy's hobby. They print those things with 3D printers and send them out looking for sex partners. They're attaching their penises to them soon. <laughs> Fuck it. There are worse things in life. Like being young and alone at home in the evening. My little self-made family are all out. Gemma's shopping, Minna's at the gym, and I'm hanging around here making a video that no one except you, dear Paul, will ever watch. Good evening, furniture. So what did you lot get up to today? The silence always traps me when I'm home. The bed, old bastard laughs while I decay. It smells so lonely in the flat. There's a yellow lamp, I watch it hang. I don't know what I like more, being alone here or with the gang. Love's only a thing in songs, I get bored. Life don't have nothing like it anymore. And if you ever get that kind of urge, then it's only at night a naked surge. I'm just gonna chop myself a bit more and then I'm going to turn the light off scared. Not that I'm keen on being naked. And urge isn't really the right word. The only things I have an urge for are like, places and things I know. I never get an urge to see the summit of the Himalayas or to have a colonoscopy. I just get an urge for a feeling 
<laughs> I know from films. I've never been loved by anyone. Not in that violent way that love gets loaded up with in art and the media anyway. That person who got enchanted by me without ever getting used to me, that person doesn't actually exist. Even though I do meet all the visual criteria that a desirable person needs to nowadays. I have good teeth and I'm politically correct. <laughs> Is that you I hear whimpering in disagreement, Paul? <laughs> On evenings like this, I get this vague fear that Everything might just stay the way it is now, gray. And that I might slide straight from this dawning young person into what I see in old people. <laughs> Pure despair. <laughs> like an unkept promise. Everyone I know is searching for this unknown thing, which they almost feel those times when they have just the right amount of alcohol in their body and just the right <laughs> song is on. We want to be limitless and infinite, but really, we're just this drunk person going home with someone who's also drunk and just going home with someone. Mm. I went home with Lena, but then I'm afraid this feeling started inside me. But I ignore it. I'm brilliant at ignoring feelings. Mm. Now we're very good friends, she said. And I'm not suffering from unrequited love. I'm just going through a personality development. I'm learning not to have any expectations, to take what I'm given. Blah. <laughs> I don't know any girl who doesn't love a bit of unrequited love anyway. You really lose weight for one thing. <laughs> and all those deep thoughts are pretty great too. Unrequited love always gives me the feeling that I'm an especially emotional person. Do you like my video blogs? The everyday life of a teenager? Or are they pissing you off? Are you chewing the carpet? Oh wait, you haven't got any carpet. Better that way. The absence of decorative elements, the lack of a fascinator, encourage you to concentrate on the essential things, on the human remains. So focus! Look, the sun is going down. Maybe it's actually dying. I haven't been outside to check. This amazing outside isn't really doing it for me at the moment because that's where the world is and you have to have an attitude to it, you have to have opinions, and they have to be politically correct. I have to keep checking the stream of my thoughts for correctness. What marginalized group, for example, women, could be offended by what heteronormative phrase? Heteronormative is the word of the season. <laughs> Last year, it was authentic, and the year before that, sustainable. Before printing, think of the environment. <laughs> we all wear the same serious faces while we talk the same meaningless shit. We scratch thoughtfully out our noses, which are marked with notches from our clean glass glasses. That sounds as if I hate all people around me, but that's only partly true. <laughs> In the powerlessness of my status as a female citizen, it's up to me to riot and debase others, even though my decision-making power is limited to blogging and making the relevant consumer choices. Every second of the day, advertisers, in despair because everyone hates them so much, fire these thousands of bits of content into the net, and I have to deny them access to my thoughts. No, I don't want any fucking sit it shit Coffee. I'm not into things that have been through an animal's body. I can decompose things by myself and I demand the right to decide whether a normal cheat bean can perform the task of satisfying me as a health conscious food. We get fractions of a second to decide whether these products can keep their endorphin spraying promises and yet we're manufactured in a politically unobjectable way. Are they fucking well sustainable? and sexy? 
You have to keep thinking about it. So how the fuck are you supposed to concentrate on your well-tuned lifestyle? Not much chance if you've got ADHD. So all you're left with are projects. And the first project is me. The many different branches of me could form a chorus in an anti-capitalist play and sing, well, I don't want any fucking civet shit coffee, and I don't want any sneakers, especially not sneakers, the perfect symbol of third world exploitation. Can you still say that? Mm -hmm. Or do you have to say countries with suboptimal income structures? <laughs> there I said it. The evil words. Income structures. Paul, are you still listening? Aren't you? Or have you lost consciousness again? Consciousness again, you fucking victim. But I hardly ever say victim anymore nowadays. The times when I used to beat people up, but was really beating myself up, as my imaginary lawyer would say, are <laughs> long gone. It's only on days like today, really boring days, that I still think about them. What? You? Nice little thing like you? You got into fights? You could ask. And I would say, oh yeah. If you're aggressive enough and you're not scared of a little bit of violence, pretty much everyone else is scared of you. And off we go, as the sun sets, Gemma, Minna, and me, with our hoodies, with our masks, sometimes our bear costumes, weather permitting, with baseball bats, nail-studded clubs. We take on one or two boys, sometimes groups of three, but only if they look definitely younger than us. Kick them in the back of the knees, use a surprise. Sometimes we hear their noses break, head on the curbstone, but I swear, we never broke anyone's neck. We just wanted to see whatever was left there bleeding, pissing itself. Gemma always hated it. She was worried about her nails and kept quoting statistics that demonstrated the probability that sooner or later one of our victims would die or that we'd get arrested or that we're actually just psychopaths. I have thought about it. We stopped then and started doing yoga. No, just kidding. We moved in together, and now we live out the peaceful parts of our personality. You know, all that feminine stuff. Ribbon knitting, little bunches of flowers and vases. Fashion and cosmetics blogging at the same time. Today we've become what this imaginary society expects of us. Shoe obsessed, neat, sweet, and we always laugh at the right time at other people, in other words or if we think of new illnesses. We are masters of simulating ADHD, Asperger's, borderline personality disorder, and we swap Ritalin pills like they were apps. I put out cigarettes on my arms, shaved my head Britney style, stapled magnets under my skin, and pushed hooks through my lips, only so I could belong to the right group, to the cool people. I'm a stellar bipolar. <laughs> Lena! <sighs> Flip out. Flip the fuck out. Go crazy. Bonkers. Wait. I'm just gonna fall over? I'm gonna fall over right now. Okay. I'm really calm. Completely within myself. Centered. I'm not in love. Mm. And I managed to wait casually for hours before I look at this text. Determined yawn. <gasps> I'll just take a very quick look. Lena says she woke up this morning in bed with a young man. Excuse me, that's a puke. <laughs> Who is not her boyfriend and is unlikely to become her boyfriend. Definitely not. Who wants anything as fucking tragic as a relationship? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just got the puke again. <clears throat> but who she's experienced this like moment with. Everything is right in harmony and all that. Soulmates. Wait, did, you, did she just say soulmates? Mm -hmm. And it's a 
as though they knew each other in another life. Another life? <laughs> Near death experience? Soulmate, soul transfer, comfort zone? I roll my eyes. Wait, I'll show you. <laughs> you think, sure. And Lena goes on. I'm not waiting for him to call because I'm into claims of heteronormative possession, but because I think the uniqueness of the connection between our personalities deserves us to carry on seeing each other. Know what I mean? And me like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Lena studies art history or theater or culture management. I didn't listen to this. <laughs> I was too busy staring at her neck. <laughs> and the hair on her arms, which I wanted to touch. Oh, I need a drink. I'm pretty good at always getting just the right amount of alcohol inside me. Not enough to piss myself, too much to pass as a sober person. <laughs> For no reason, I keep thinking about people who pretend to be adults and spend hours slurping, slurping wine doing important faces. There's literally nothing grimmer. Hello, they might as well say. I've done nothing in my life except be mediocre, and now I slurp wine and go to the opera. <laughs> Nina doesn't answer. Now why isn't she answering? All I wrote is, do you think he sees it that way? <laughs> now she won't answer. Does she think I'm in love with her? I think the one thing that's even shittier than being in unrequited love is watching the person you're in unrequited love with be in unrequited love. <laughs> Last week, I was with Lena with some friends of friends type people in one of those exposed concrete Uber apartments, which had an artwork in a 600 square meter space, carefully arranged in tense juxtaposition to a really uncomfortable sofa. Anyway, Lena was sitting on this also like sofa saying, that's like an amazing apartment for lovers. And I was sitting right next to her and it was obvious she didn't mean me. Do you know what I mean, Paul? Lena's only doing what we all do. She just doesn't want anyone who wants her because that sounds too boring and not passionate. She, Wants something that makes excitement and pain. She wants not to be wanted. She wants someone who's in a relationship or needs to think or is blocked right now or needs some time. Then you can be so nice and deep and suffer and write poems. And then three weeks later, the next thing comes along. Does it ever stop? This stupid suffering? If I could ask you, you'd nod. Maybe when you're over 40, you'd say, if you could talk. But you can't, <laughs> which is a shame, because you've got that fucking sock in the way. I think when you're over 40 and not into sex anymore, you probably start thinking, people who don't want me can kiss my ass. I'd rather clean the apartment anyway. I should probably do that. My apartment has no chance on ending up on a blog as an example of an ironic yet cool interior design. No one is going to stop and think, wow, this is the apartment of an urban trendsetter. Although the punch bag and the swords do make an impression. For a girl, you have to add in a slightly raised voice. My interior design style betrays my earnest efforts at authenticity. Dried leaves under glass, an old teddy bear that was never mine. As you know, I never had any toys. Photos of children who were never a part of my family. As you know, even though I did have a family, it wasn't one you'd want to take photos of. <laughs> it's the apartment of a young woman with the usual defects. <laughs> themselves easily kept under control with tablets and therapy. <laughs> Minna. Fuck me, Minna, you're right. We have to cook up 10 hundred packs of Viagra today. 
C22H30 and C604S, melting point 187 degrees Celsius. Thanks for what felt like you asking, Paul. Our legal pharmaceutical business is doing great. Mm -hmm. I was only average in chemistry, as many of my clients would confirm. <laughs> but it's all on the internet now anyway. That cute little internet that people are so scared of. Oh, you don't even know what the internet is. Oh, well. While other young people beg off their parents to do unpaid internships in online shops, we make bombs and drugs. <laughs> But the products that sell the best are the ones that satisfy people's desire for inexhaustible sexual ability. Mina, you know, my roommate, alcoholic's daughter from an immigrant family, father from Maine, mother from Trenton. Do you remember how we met? Or weren't you listening? We were 10 on a summer camp where we got kicked out of different groups for different reasons. We bonded because we had this feeling we were alone in the world and complete losers. Minna runs our company's online presence, orders, homepage, data encryption. Maybe one day she'll have a proper company. She deserves it. At the moment, we're having a little friendship crisis. For 10 years, we were connected by our outsider thing. And then Minna got into keeping fit. That's it. No punchline. Oh. Minna, you're at Zumba. Great. Obviously, you can't be here with me on this beige Saturday if you're doing dance routines in unaired rooms. Breathe in. Calm down. I should probably say, Minna's physical exercise thing might be making me so angry because I'm a size 10 and I really need to do something about it because it's unacceptable for a young woman to wear a size 10 and then face the saleswoman disgusted looks in the shops or in summer puke at the swimming pool, yuck, because we can't just have an entire demographic of, of, of a group waddling down the street padded with fat, basically because you can't meet the demands of the system when you're listing to one side. Oh. Minna! <laughs> No, I can't go outside. Sorry, I, I have to finish some pills. Someone has to work around here. Finish the evening delivery for the online customers who get hard-ons thanks to their powers of auto-suggestion, plus a little rat poison and glucose. Anyway, I have to call mother today. I have to learn a foreign language. And more than anything, I have to not do Zumba ever. <laughs> yes! Minna, I went shopping, low-fat milk, rice cakes, and tofu. I failed to mention the crate of Red Bull, vodka, and ice cream. Mm -hmm. Feel guilty about that, obviously. It started when I was nine, and one of my breasts started growing, and I thought it was fat, and I starved myself. <laughs> and when the others at school started wearing brands and Prada bags, and all I had was a fake Gucci bag and an extra 10 kilos. Nina writes, he called. Bully for him, I answered. And vomit. He had too much to do with his projects, she writes. And I get a stomach ache that I have no choice but to call him with ice cream. Last week, she was on an island and emailed me, revealing her feelings in detail. That's not like her. It went like this. I've been on this island for two weeks. For the last two days, I've been thinking I might carry on living, though I don't think about why. How come I can walk again and breathe and see the stars on some nights and feel something other than this mass in my chest that makes my breath so short, but that becomes liquid on some nights and lets me breathe out and feel something different from this numbness? 
I don't know what it is yet. I just think that I'll carry on living. An island was put, thrown into the water so people could dream of it, of how nice it would be to sit on this heap. And once they're there, their palms start sweating because they realize it's actually quite hard to find your way off an island. The sea, friend in the tedium, cubic hundred weights of sadness and tedium, liquid stupidity. My heart beats quietly, and that's what I still want from life, some good rest. There's a person at home I should stay with. At this point in the email, I was already lying on the floor because obviously she meant me. Because he does me good. He carries me over brooks, covers me at night, and my heart stays quiet. It's as if it doesn't matter. Something's died, I don't know what, but it's good that it's dead. I've become reasonable, I've become a grown up. Overnight, whichever night that was. We laughed a lot, didn't eat much, didn't sleep at all. It was the kind of love that might turn into hate or rage or mourning, but will never end and never not matter, never. Too much of everything, tears and blood. And he was so beautiful that people had to look away. I had to look away because Beauty scares people, freezes people. It's unstoppable. If only I could have held him. And all I wanted was to lie next to him, on top of him, underneath him, and look at him, and not move or eat or breathe anymore. I lay with him in the snow, and he glowed like something radioactive, split from reactors, and I licked his nose his face clean, and I loved him so much. My life for him, because I didn't exist anymore. I wanted to saw off his arms, his legs, so he couldn't leave me. Tie him up, bend his torso, his head, his blonde head, into a box. Take him with me and be mad at everything around him that wasn't me. At everyone who was allowed to shake his hand at the chair that was allowed to carry him. I would have carried him from Moscow to Stokey. But who the hell wants to go there? Mm -hmm. He didn't want to go there. And then he left in a cold night in a strange city. And it was different from the endings before. Something died on that strange night. I saw him after he'd gone. And I knew there would never be no feelings about that image of that last night because he told me he was going in the morning and I tried to use my body to crawl inside his until he froze in revulsion. That night, the coldest of my life. That was the night I grew old, grew old. And now I'm becoming a woman. <clears throat> now I'm going to live a wonderful life. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going home tomorrow to the person who does me good. Dude, I swear she means me! <laughs> Lena says she's meeting him tomorrow. And that she's excited. And if it's all right, she calls me later. And me, I'll like, yeah, sure. Don't know if I'll be in then. Very <laughs> funny. <laughs> I'm going to carry the phone in my hand check it every few minutes, and at two in the morning, she's gonna send a series of incomprehensible texts, which I'll read deep messages into, things like, bye, see you soon, I'll kiss that, bye, see you soon, and into that soon, I'm gonna read the promise of a future together. Fuck. Sometimes I can't wait to get old, because maybe that means not being this stupid anymore. Not having to go to those fucking parties anymore, those gallery openings, or those protest festivals, or those <laughs> modern dance productions. And this standing in corners making hedonistic plans, all of which absolutely have to end in a performance piece. All that stuff you have to do at a certain age to prove you're alive. 
But what the fuck am I actually doing with this fucking SpongeBob tattoo on my hand? Whenever my people go to a <laughs> site-specific immersive experience, mm -hmm. we get surrounded by vultures dressed as old men. They wear Converse and think they'll distract us from their faces. <laughs> Definite no. Ever since I can think or walk, I get surrounded by old men who want to take photos of me because they're talent scouts or they want to help me. They say, hey, you must be pretty insecure standing there like that. Or I expect your looks work against you. Or don't pretend to be so cool. You're still just a little girl who wants to be loved. But they're talking about themselves when they say that love thing. I used to feel weirdly uncomfortable after these old men came up to talk to me. Now, I just imagine what they look like dying. I hold them in a tight hug, these old men, stroke their shrunken skulls, their breathing slows down. They cling on to my arm. Please, I don't want to go yet, they say. And then I close their eyes gently and say, you never had a chance. <laughs> Minna, 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 are you still listening to me? She's not listening to me anymore. I can hear a rhythmic stamping and stomping in the thoughts of 3,000 housewives, mothers, war ravaged people. We like to steam off. We love our sweat. It's aromatic and athletic at the same time. As long as we keep busy, sustainably busy, we should say, desperately trying to eat too little in the day and at night secretly stuffing ourselves with baby food we hidden under the bed and then running up and down the stairs ten times because you can't puke up baby food. As long as we keep watching makeup tips on the internet and prodding our bodies for cellulite, then we don't deserve to win the battle. The battle for what anyway? World domination! Okay, fine, but... Ugh. I can't stand us, Minna. Some days, I just actually can't stand us with our addiction to perfection. What's the point? To be a perfect, sustainable corpse? Oh. <laughs> the family's calling. I don't know anyone apart from Gemma who uses Viber. She likes that squeaky noise. <laughs> Gemma, my possibly manic depressive half-sister, the business side of our enterprise. Gemma isn't actually her name, but her real name was too provincial for her. I can only stand her because we're related and because we've been through things you don't forget. I stand her because I, under I understand her obsession with wanting to be loved because I accept that there are people who just give up, who just pack up their sanity and say, the only thing that still counts today is money, which means I want a lot of it, which means I smile. It doesn't matter that my sphincter's failing from the constant stress outside. It doesn't matter that I've got psoriasis from all the competition out there that makes people rush through their lives like their own coke about to lose their minds. I understand people who just do what everyone else does. The easiest thing to do in the world. Look good and shop. <laughs> Gemma, no, I don't want to go out. I don't want to go shopping with you. I have to work. Do you know what shopping is, Paul? It used to be called going to the shops. And if you believe, the old films, it meant going into a black and white shop and choosing between two types of cabbage. Today, <laughs> you shop. Just like that, it doesn't matter what. And it isn't embarrassing because you're fulfilling your civic duty. I could tell you how the shops have changed in the past five years, that by buying products, you become part of a family that you prefer to your own. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're more interested in watching whatever that stuff is growing out of the holes in your flesh. Gemma, no, I've got no idea what the key pieces of the season are. Less is more, Gemma. Put that amphibian leather thing back on the shelf. Lena, my future ex-love. 
I'm so glad she wants to dump her worries on me. I'll take them and sling them around my neck like a chain of sausages. <laughs> so, Leah's snogging a young man called Sven, <laughs> who she's cheating with to torment the young man she's in love with. And she still has time to text me. <laughs> and honestly, if only we could use all the time we waste fucking people we don't really like to build utopian communities. <laughs> Minna from the toilets at Zumba, where she's doing a bit of coke so she can enjoy the final stages of the dance event. She'll be back late tonight. She wants to go over to Beth's who also has a different name in real life, <laughs> and is a woman who used to be a man, or the other way around, it doesn't matter, unless you're unlucky enough to meet a pack of moronic young men who are depressed because the world isn't giving them enough attention, and aggressive because they're not taking their pills. They go mad if you threaten their masculinity by kissing the wrong people. It's weird when you think that our brains are in constant contact with all corners of the world, and that we're getting more and more open and politically correct all the time, or should be. The truth is outside, remotely controlling spy drums with penises stuck on them, talking idiot idiotic ghetto slang, and kicking the shit out of anything that doesn't fit their worldview. In other words, everything. My mother used to tell me when she was still interested in something other than watching her walls. Just wait till you're older, then you'll learn to fear men. And I thought, yawn. Today I regret being peace-loving and no longer thoughtlessly using my combat boots to express sustainability. <laughs> sustainability is Gemma's thing. And Viber squeak for every bag. I'm dying inside. <coughs> Gemma's still weighing up different products. Sometimes I think she must be healthier than me, being so totally free of any resistance to the system. Studying business, paying for her higher education with illegal pharmaceuticals, shopping, planning holidays on the Cote d'Azur. Gemma is fine with all that. While I was still working off my aggression against my invisible enemies on victims who couldn't help they were the wrong sex, Gemma was already doing her masters. Sometimes, I wonder whether my lack of empathy is something I should worry about, or whether I just have a bit too much testosterone. You're <coughs> a bit inconsistent, aren't I, Paul? You're in a precarious, risky situation, and you're trying to figure out, what kind of person am I? A normal young person, it seems, with all these normal young person things, with Dirty fingernails, cut off trousers, a weird hairstyle, and no clue what to do with this life. A psycho, you think, because I hit people. Well, used to hit people. With this strange kind of aggression and hatred for all the different lifestyles I see around me. The way people fall for all this shit. You have to work to be fit for your work so you can work more, and then you have to earn money to get into debt and earn even more money so you can go shopping, so you can get into even more debt, you fucking slave. Yep. Confusing, isn't it, Paul? You know what confuses me? The rain out there that never ends, and the disasters, the tornadoes, and floods, and diseases that keep getting closer, and everyone pretends they're just a passing phase, but what if this really is the end? And we're gonna have one of those Roland Emmerich scripts out there, the ice age and the floods and nowhere left to go. And not even a religion that I can believe in so that if I have enough pity for all those oppressed fuckers, there's this golden place waiting for me somewhere up there. I'm not even fucking pious, just clueless because nothing seems worth it. And except for having fun, nothing is worth it. And sometimes I'm tired of this flood of fun that actually isn't really fun at all. Gemma, what do you mean you're depressed? Gemma got very bad style reviews on a fashion blog for her in-between outfit. She believes in the system and is going to be the first person ever to have her vagina straightened. The complete absence 
of depression in Gemma's psyche is really getting to me. How does she stand it? Knowing that you're going to die one day and be shoved naked into an oven. How can you stand knowing you're alone with your responsibility to a life where you do everything wrong and no one is going to come and save you? Knowing that you're alone. It's unbearable on some, some days. On some nights when I come back from parties from so-called social contract, from so-called having fun, from alcohol and chemical support, and then the Blackbird avatar starts singing and the plaster avatar gleams moistly and I realize I will never experience this moment again. And maybe no better one either, that everything might actually stay this way in an in-between zone of undefined feelings that nothing will ever happen that I can tell apart from my state of indecisiveness. Pretty neat for someone without a philosophy degree. <laughs> Lena writes, she says she's basically confused by sex. Well, there's a surprise. <laughs> no one understands sex. The obsessive talk, the swinger clubs, the latex costumes, old people's sex advice makes us sick, but we haven't mm -hmm. found anything new. Mm -hmm. We watch you porn ironically, do some gender neutral snogging fuck without it meaning anything. Every now and then there's an abortion or an 18 year old mother, but no one has ever really understood what sex is about. No one I know anyway. Paul, I'm talking about sex. Probably here in my bedroom, my power place, I would say, if I was a bit bonkers, which I've set out according to the principles of feng shui, scream. Sex was never as nice as I imagined it. I imagined. I see a person glowing. We recognize each other, approach, silence, music, then holding hands, walking slowly away together. In my imagination, there would always be a completely secluded meadow available where we could lay ourselves out without it being damp or cornered by insects. Music, then look into each other's eyes for ages, stroking the hair on our bodies, laughing, embarrassed, then sunset. <coughs> then kissing for hours, holding each other, pressing against each other, to be honest, in my imagination, there was never any bodily smells or sweating, mm -hmm. and we never talked. The music would always cover it. The truth is, drunk, party, tense, light drizzle, a person and me snogging next to an upturned beer bottle, then into the tent, fumbling, cold feet, breath, not so great. Skirt up, trousers down, pain, finish, sticky, <clears throat> crying. Music from the next tent. Pitbull? Hell on earth. I was sitting bare assed on the toilet of a rainy campsite crying and not knowing why. Booze, the bad weather mixed with the disappointment. It was so nothing. Minna! Mother! 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 Of course. Mother always calls when I think about sex. It's like having her stand in the door watching me masturbate. Shit, Mother, I've got <laughs> Minna on the other phone. <laughs> yes, I know, I, should, I shouldn't say shit, but I'm currently being overstimulated by my technical accessibility. And anyway, it's Saturday night. I'm in the middle of recording a film. I had half a bottle of, oh, oh forget it. Minna, I've got my mother on the phone. Yes, the phone. She thinks the internet is under surveillance and cell phones are the, activate the spores of some kind of fungus in your brain. Mother, yes, I'll be with you in a minute. Conversations with mother are always connected with certain feelings, usually helplessness, because she expects me to produce a life plan. Barley, anyone has one of those? Because we know that you can't plan anything anymore. And then most people go into an ordering system where they let themselves be stored away. Learn, study, go to work, marry, make a baby, put down a deposit for an apartment. And then they lose their jobs, the systems break down, and they hang themselves. Or 
Something shows them that life can be different. If you break out, grow beards, live in communes, live gay, transgender, queer, or they become gorillas and find some obvious enemies to fight, we should all just stop participating out there. It's also ridiculous. On a rainy night, in the final phase of economic growth, in the middle of the end of the world, which I'm not allowed to believe in because I have to reproduce. But not today. Mother, yes, of course I've been thinking about my future today. The world, and I realize this at 6.34 p.m., is waiting for me to free it from mediocrity. Mother doesn't believe in the struggle. She doesn't know what's worth fighting for. For her, life has got to be harmonious, uncomplicated, well-tended, and peaceful. Mother believes that by conceiving offspring, she's done her bit towards saving the world. So I had to show her another life. I had to do that, didn't I? I had to show her that it's always worth Minna, I, Minna screams, the day after tomorrow there's a new phone coming out which is similar to her own phone. It won't work two years from now when it will desperately need to be replaced with a new phone. And then you have to stand in a queue and the sales personnel will cheer for the first idiot who leaves, on, leaves the shop with this new phone which is just like the old phone but new. <laughs> Mother? I, I can't hear you. I can't hear anyone. There's this rushing in my ears. The camera's on. The apartment is floating in the sea. Strange. It's vibrating in the room. Somewhere in the city, four people are sitting at their devices in silence, and someone else is sitting in silence because he doesn't have any other choice. <laughs> hey, Paul. When no one talks to me, my existence becomes blurry. I don't know how people can stand it. For decades, alone with themselves, with this so-called life. I, this so-called life that goes by so fast because you're always waiting for the summer, which happens for a few days, and then you run outside and try like mad to enjoy your existence. And that puts me in a really bad mood. Lena! Oh, God! Lena! I've just forgotten her for a few minutes. And now she wants to talk. Because she's bored. Uh, mother? I never called you mom. Because that's a warm word. And our story, at least from my point of view, was a bit tense, mother, because you never were a role model for me. Mother, I'm scared. At night, more than anything, I'm scared that I'll stay the loneliest person on earth, the ugliest, the saddest, the only one ever who doesn't know how to understand they're just a cog in the history of the world. I'm scared it won't get better, and that I'm not a superheroine who bravely creeps up on boys at night and saves her mother from the patriarchy, but that I'm just a bitch like all the others. Mother's sitting in darkness. She's crying. It's Paul's birthday. Paul is my father. <sighs> He's disappeared. He just didn't come home one day. Weird. And since then, Mother has been sitting there waiting for something to grow out of the wall. Gemma has finally found a bag. She's on her way home. Ah, Mom, Mother! I hear mother breathing. She's waiting too long. 
Everything she does seems to be aimed at making me uncomfortable. Staying quiet for too long, breathing too loud, sounding strange. She succeeds. Mother, have you, and by that I mean you, old people, got any happier with your goals? Your family goals, real estate goals, separating your rubbish goals. And when I say you, I mean generation. I know all this generation talk is totally fucking idiotic. Gemma, I thought you were coming home. I can't, I'm on the phone with mother. Yes, our mother. You think I randomly call mothers I'm not related to? Hello, are you her mother and do you feel like talking? Our mother, who's sitting frozen in the darkness. Wait a minute, Minna. I thought you were on your way home and you were bringing salad. Gemma, wait. Minna just found out some kind of new hacking shit on the way home. <laughs> Ow, mother! Silence. Minna, I think I'm drunk. I'm staggering around communication loops. My interface points don't overlap, as my generation would say. Lena has found out that a woman can become addicted to sperm because it has such an amazing effect on our hormone balance. Mother, did you know what I, I've always wanted to tell you? Our family had all the intensity of a glass of lukewarm water. There was nothing unique about us. Paul wasn't my father, but he behaved like he was, full of kindness and so on. He was always so exaggeratedly happy when he came home from work. He gave us a hug. Mother had a break after Gemma's birth, and the break became forever. She liked it in forever. She wasn't bored. She looked okay for a woman in her late 30s. And on the weekend, we went to the YMCA. I mean, it's not a childhood you could use as an excuse for some kind of failure. If you haven't at least got an alcoholic, sex abuser, or a childhood in a forest being raised by a family of animals, you can't expect accentuating circumstances in young offenders court. One day, I thought maybe if Paul never came home, it would give my life story a kick in the ass. Maybe you'd become like, a desperate social services case. And with your last despairing powers, you might turn into a JK Rowling type thing. That you could finally become that damn role model I needed. I threw plant pots onto the street when Paul left the house. I poured sugar into the tank of his car, smeared soap on the bathroom floor, and then one day, Paul was gone. Odd. Paul was gone. And I waited for your talents to break out, but nothing broke out, nothing changed, except that you became sad and silent. When I was 18, I moved out. That was the whole story. I left you alone. Can I write a poem about it? October, Sunday. Tea's cold, can't drink. You clear your throat and speak, and the blue lights wink. The tea's no good against this thirst. Gap's too wide. We sit and breathe. Can't swim across, get off the island, choke. But how can we leave? Years forgotten, melted now, gone away. Staring into cups. You know I like you, is all you say. I know, but it's not enough. Won't do. No good to hold your hand, can't hold you tight. When you go, don't turn off the light. October night blew through the tree by the house came the light. Took the gray suitcase, moved out of your life, your sight. October night, maybe the light stays, dust to float. The world was still and you said, quiet, don't forget your coat. We talked for hours at that table by that wall found in a French warehouse on holiday, but that was really all. You said I was distant, your fingers flickered, twitched some more. I said I liked you, but it wasn't enough anymore. Even the rain outside stopped, and inside the world stood still. You said, I'll go pack, don't need much for now. The tea is cold, climb the groaning stairs. I feel my throat, I'm at that table and say quiet, just don't forget your coat. 
So you're gonna go, you say. I say, goodbye, suppose I better go. Hours later, you're staring at that gap I left, that hole. You wash the cups, clean the plates, cream your face, cupboard bare. And then you stop for years on end, just standing there. Paul disappeared a year later. Shit happened. And my mother didn't become a chancellor or a microbiologist. She dried out. She expired. And that's my fault. Mother, are you there? Are you crying? Nina, you really can go fuck yourself. Mm -hmm. Nina, Gemma, please come home. Paul, are you still in the cellar? Are you scared of every new day? Are you scared I'll forget you're down there? Are you scared you'll go blind if you ever step out into the light again? Don't worry, you won't be seeing any more light. I can't get out of this anymore. You understand that, don't you? I can't get out of this. Are you all out there in this city? dark now? Are you standing at your windows and waiting for your lives to begin? Are you waiting for it to finally start the great adventure? The empty rooms leave all these questions. Do you people out there even exist? Or is there just this empty bottle and me and my devices and It doesn't matter. I'm young. For me, it all starts tomorrow. Tomorrow, the world. Andy, thank you so much, and a big applause again for Anna and Andy. Wow, that was uh, that was quite a, a reading, quite a tour de force. Thank you. She's it's amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's also something about the text of Sylvia Burke. So Andy, t tell me about it. You said, I want to direct it, I teach her. What's going on, why do you like her work? So um, I first uh, became aware of this play in Sibella Berg a couple years ago. I was teaching a course in contemporary European drama at NYU, and I was looking for new plays, and particularly plays by women. And I don't know exactly the, the connection, but I ended up talking to Ben Wright, who translates a lot of Sibella's plays. And uh, I read this and just uh, uh, instantly loved it. And so I've been, I've been teaching it for a couple of years and then saw that you were going to be doing a reading of it. So I asked uh, to be a part of it. What do you see in the play? Um, uh, I, I, I just think Sibella has managed to capture, uh, even though this is not her generation, the, the voice of, of, of young women in a way that is really remarkable. The sort of, uh, and again, this is through Ben Wright's translation, but the, the cleverness and idiosyncrasies of the language, uh, the way that language is just um, deconstructed and played with and um, 
uh, um, political but disposable, that she just kind of nailed a, a voice or a tone. Uh, and that's been borne out by my students. One of, my, my, one of the students in my classes said, I felt like I was reading my own journal. That young people in their, like, young, uh, in their 20s sort of really read this and connect with it. And Sibella is not, I mean, I think Sibella is uh, older, definitely older than that. It's, this is not her, her generation. She's been trilocalizing of a generation, but, um, but endearingly so. So yeah, that was that was on first reading it. Anna, how did you? How was that for you? That experience? Um, how was that experience? <laughs> um, well, it's very cool to see a text that long and that full um, with so many complex ideas for someone of my age and for my generation is really exciting. I, when we were doing tech today, I was like, this is like my happy days of right now which is cool. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I completely uh, agree with Andy that, it, that she somehow manages to capture um, a lot of different points of view on, 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 in a very specific age group as a young woman. Yeah. Yeah, and if you talk about happy days, though, instead of being buried in sand, she's buried in the kind of a digital world, and she had is barely, yeah. she's barely functioning. Mm -hmm. um, and you did so, yeah, did so. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, when I teach it, I teach it in the context of digital dramaturgies, that this is, um, there's something about being alone and all your connections being through all of these devices mm -hmm. and living a world virtually. So like the whole thing is the outside world means nothing to me. And so the, the just sort of the, the, the associative pinging from person to person as opposed to a plot or a drama, it, the, the stasis of it and the kind of uh, virtual connections, it, it, again, I think really the dramaturgy of it co connects to a contemporary moment as well. You did cuts, you changed it a bit. Tell, tell us a bit. I mean, uh, so uh, this was about half the text, um, but we, we, but because she just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks and talks and talks, talks, talks. Um, and and at some point I w wanted to show you the Gorky production of it because the 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 Gorky production is just looks radically different. Um, and I'm sure they, I know for a fact they cut the text there as well. If you just did the text at this pace like this, it would be well over two hours. And, 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 it, oh, and it was less than that there and very physical at the same time. So I, I, I mean, I, it's in the German tradition, like, you know, a, a, like an Alfreda Jelinek text where you just, a director can just cut and, and choose their way through it. This was, this was the shape of it. We just, we just pruned it down for a consumable, an audience size. So it, 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 it has all of the key sort of relationships and the points in the beginning, middle, and end, but just, she just talks a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is in the tradition of the monodrama, you know, where, you know, out of one head, out of one voice, words come up, and which is centuries old, but this certainly is the most convincing, if you would say, in kind of a digital age we live in. As Brecht said, he wrote for the children of the uh, technological age, and she writes for the children of the digital age. Uh, cl very clearly, and um, how devastating also, and when she also says, mother, I can't hear you, that disconnect, you know, which is, um, and for Europe at least, uh, um, a radical break maybe in America, it has been, you know, always be a more um, uh, loose structure in families, but for Italians or French or German families where families are families, you know, that, that devastating rapture that happened there and her uh, engagement with three screens and uh, so the, the restlessness of it, which we all know when we sit in our days uh, at, at our at work or computer in the evenings and um, it, is, uh, it is quite something that perhaps will stay, well we should monitor our screen times. But um, since we talked about the Gorky, should we look at it? Was it also one actor? I don't think so, right? So the, the script says a um, uh, uh, piece for one actor or more, what does it say? Um, uh, for one person, several voices, or something else. Uh, and so when it was done uh, at the Gorky, it was done with four actresses. Um, and then that sort of became the model for other German productions that I've seen online. It just sort of was typically done, but it's four actresses in unison. 
Um, and so you know, I think we, not only we should look at this clip, but then also this play spun a, a sequel, uh, and then came Myrna, in which the unnamed character has a child. And so the, the sequel had four women and four identical daughters, or not identical, but four daughters. And then there was a, and then it became a trilogy where she dates someone and goes out to outer space. So it was, it was, this, was this was really became a popular play and a popular, popular production. I mean, it's still in repertory at the Gorky, I believe. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's, it's also, yeah, it's such brilliant writing. As someone said, it has to be sharp as a knife, uh, clear like an ice, icicle and kind of light as a bird's foot. You know, she has all of that yeah, in yeah, there. That's and really uh, great. It's, uh, it's very, and very rare. So maybe we have a look at it. One of the uh, uh, Gorky uh, actors and co-creators of other works will still be with us at the eight, at the reception. If you come with us afterwards to the archive, so we could talk to him also a bit about it. So uh, maybe um, Jackie and Michael, thank you again all for your help at the festival. But let's have a look what the uh, Gorky. I don't think they can trump what we saw here, but. Maybe we. Um, no, no, no. no. Um, I don't remember who directed the original. I'm sorry. Um, we should be should be somewhere. Yeah. Um, maybe we open it up uh, right away to our um, I guess our final um, um, discussion. As always at the Seagull, this is a significant part of it, not a little add-on. But so we have some kind of a, you know, of a dialogue. So from the audience, some. Um, Questions or a comment or uh, something that you would like to share? I'm, we, we I'm give you, we, we are recording oh. it uh, with HowlRound, oh, which we also okay. want to thank HowlRound for sure. live streaming it. Mm -hmm. and sure, of course. Um, I'm curious, uh, uh, seeing, because when you started, I said to myself, there's more than one person on this stage, uh, which is amazing. Um, I guess my question to you as the director of this is why one person as opposed to two or four or six? I totally heard and saw and felt more than one. So that's, I mean, a, a bow to you. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I mean, because I had seen this and thought about this and, um, and it, it is about sort of, uh, the way identity sort of starts to fray at the edges, the way our identities sort of exist in, in different ways. I guess I just felt for this reading, and, and I don't believe her work has ever been done here in the United States, that this would sort of present her, her language the clearest. And it takes a lot of hours to do that well, you know? And so to, it, it, it wasn't a dialogue between people, it's multiple aspects of the same person. And to pull that off is, is just more than, we, than I could accomplish well. If I could clone four Annas, then I would do it in a second. But uh, given the time and resources, we felt this is the, the best way to honor Sabella's work for tonight. I mean, that, that was, it was just that. Well, but one could also argue the uh, three devices performed. You know, so the, yeah. they were characters, all of them. Yeah. You know, so um, they even more, and so it was a, they were there, just not as well, non-human. They were non-human robots. You know, people think robots look like the RT Dutu or whatever. You know, <laughs> no, they look like our phones. 
These are. All... I, I think those four women are Minna, Gemma, Lena, and the character. Um, and uh, that it's not just random, that it, it's not infinite number, that those are the four, mm -hmm. and that there is a certain sense of, is any of this real? Right? Is, is, is all, of the, all of this a kind of virtual fantasy? Is, is Paul, did she really kidnap her father, or did her father leave, and is this just kind of um, a fantasy that she's made up to explain his absence? And so, uh, I, I mean, I, I, so, the, so this, this format Im implies a kind of different psychology that I thought was also in the text and worth exploring. And was there something in the text where you felt this, I don't know, that I have difficulty, this doesn't feel right, or I can't connect to that, was there something, or you had to work through till you found how um, to do it? I'm lucky that a lot of that was cut for this particular, <laughs> which is luxurious. Um, um, I'm trying to think if something really stands out. I think, I think generally, I, I don't have as strong opinions on anything that the character talks about as strongly as the character does. Like, I, I don't think, and, and Andy had to explain to me that the German thoughts are like, it's like thoughts and parenthetical, and so many parentheticals, and then like a verb, and then more stuff. And so just sort of like, my brain doesn't work that way. Yeah, really. Did you know that about you? Um, but in, in that writing, having that <laughs> translated into English was a completely, like, a, a really wonderful and um, interesting challenge. Because it's not in my training to, to, to think quite that in that many stages, you know what I mean? It's, I think it's a brilliant translation, actually, and it added actually something actually to the to, to the work, which not always happens. Yes. Great job. Um, so when I see this, I think, okay, I want to throw away all my technology tonight and get outside and meet as many different kinds of people as possible. I'm wondering, do you think the character has any sort of change in her view on the world between or from the beginning to the end of the piece? Um, I, I think maybe there's a toying with, with what it would be like to leave this room and leave the devices, and please, feel free to disagree with me, um, and that actually delving into the trauma only reinforces the safety of being here. That, that, so I think there's a question that, that's always being sort of toyed with, and then the character is is answers it with the same answer every day, you know. Um, yeah, but it's difficult, right? It's hard to maintain. Like I, a line that I love, I'll paraphrase it, is is like when people don't talk to me, like my existence is blurry or something like yeah. that. That like when when there isn't any contact, that's when I think the the flooding in of the you know the demons come in, and then. <laughs> Yeah, the outside is too scary. Yeah. What did you think? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, did you think, I mean, uh, I mean, well, I guess one of the questions you're asking is that like in a traditional play, as a director or working with an actor, you'd go, how does an actor, how does the character change from the beginning to the end? And you're looking for that sort of dramatic through line. Um, and, it's, I think it's a valid question of whether that exists in this play or not. I mean, I think one thing to hang your hat on is that she does kind of give up on this Lena fantasy at the end. So there is a kind of putting away of something that she knows is not healthy. But that's pretty small potato. <laughs> and she might have another one tomorrow. And there might be another one tomorrow. She seems so, lost. She yeah. seems... Uh, uh, the, the ending is a little... That, and the ending was not um, abridged. Like, that's the ending, which is very quick, that suddenly, like, okay, well, maybe tomorrow I'll go out. That, that, that's all the text you get for a kind of turnaround at the end. Maybe unconvincing, it, it deliberately. I don't know. What... Yeah, it, it feels very stagnant, which I guess is the point. Um, so I, and it feels very one note, actually, even though, yes, there are multiple, there are so many ideas coming and going. Um, it feels very myopic. 
Um, and um, I guess that's how I. Yeah. Do we have a, a one more thought or comment or yeah. um, Okay, so um, I thought it was very interesting, but I wasn't completely convinced that the um, the, the devices uh, made for such a very different profile of youth than I experienced. I mean, if you substitute, um, you know, the nuclear war for climate change, if you substitute the telephone that you're waiting for, for, you know, the multiple different thongs and things, um, knocks at the door. I mean, it, I think that it, it really portrayed, I mean, I identified with it as if, when I was in my, like, 20s or early 30s. It felt very familiar. Um, and, of course, you know, the idea that it's so modern. But I wonder, I, I think that the power of the, the play came from the fact that there's something far more universal of, about um, young life in a urban, sophisticated setting. You know, I, I was in New York and um, I don't know what city in Germany that was originally played in. But I mean, I think it's very characteristic of uh, like a sort of hopelessness and there was a, a, an added layer of it though. But I think that might be due to the history of the current world. But it, on the other hand, it really didn't feel that unfamiliar to me. Well, it feels like it's kind of an updated software system. You know, it's kind of, you know the old one, but this is the next layer of. Yeah, like a, 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 a contemporary feminist Holden Caulfield or something, you know, that, that, that kind of teenage snark and attitude. But, but I do think, for me, one of the things that it struck me at the test is that you don't really hear like a, a, a female monologue like this very often. I mean, I can really think of too many others. Uh, you know, the disaffected teenage male we hear a lot of, but less so of, of women. Uh, very young, you know. I was thinking, well, she has a career making these, you know, pills and drugs and whatever, so she probably isn't exactly a teenager. 18, but we said, like, you know, early 20s. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I mean, she does say at one point teenager, but I think, but we, we think, I said early 20s, yeah. yeah. Um, and but and yes, but it, but it is also just a language play, and the language is also is what is what marks it as utterly. In fact, it's almost it's like it will. I, it, this is a play that will age quickly, I think, uh, and then it, and then twenty years from now it will be kind of a good period piece. But uh, it's almost out of date. The references will go, Zumba will go will is already a little dated. You know what I mean? Like so, there's certain things that mark it as two thousand. Yeah. Uh, 12 or something when it was written and, and now it's already just starting around the edges uh, the, uh, in terms of the cultural the hopelessness, the inability to connect that's like yes, yeah, I agree yeah, but, um, it, it, yeah, that's true it's, it's an update but in a way to giving to the data I think lots of the Gorky plays feels like pop songs or pop play they are made for the moment when they are created, as we heard last Zeitstück. three days ago, yeah, huh? Zeitstück. Yeah, Zeitstück. I mean, they have 40 of them in repertoire, and then they also change a little bit. They said, "Oh no, this something was about ISIS, but now ISIS is out. Okay, let me change it." You know, so because so they adapt it also, but they are a different idea. Also, they are not meant to be classics. Um, they really are like a song of a, a summer of a fall, and there's something very beautiful about it. Also, something highly crafted that we don't know. There are so many love songs, and then one love song we like. Well, they're just the same stupid words, the same stupid melodies, but some catches it, and I think she, of course, um, found something here. Also interesting, I think, is uh, her inability to be alone. She is so alone, but she can't be. She has all these things around. Heiner Müller famously said, um, so much evil in the world came from people, especially men, not being able to be alone. Mm -hmm. That Chinggis Khan had to go 
destroy the world, create a bigger empire. He had no home to return to. And he talked that about Kleist, the German writer, he said, you know, who killed himself. He had no home to really be, feel at home because Germany was not his home and he couldn't write it. And she also, she is at home, but she has no home and she's alone, but she can't be alone. And this is kind of a, a real, uh, uh, something of a 21st century that, that she captured um, something of it and um, kind of shocking that this is the first reading of such a significant work in European or German theater. It's, you were all here. This was the uh, American premiere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been here for the last three days, see, seen five of the six uh, performances. And uh, w w in my mind, looking at the Corky Theater and looking at what we've, you've done, it, I get this sense of, a, of their thread of existential angst uh, running through all of their work. It, it's just the struggle of who we are living with ourselves and living in the world that we, we and your, your commodification of being you in this play just comes out to me and just, you know, I'm a commodity, I'm waiting. Uh, I'm just wondering, does that resonate with you as, as uh, the director and, and you as uh, Don Ludlin, Lud, Ludlin? You know, you were a, the producer of uh, yesterday's performance. Uh, as uh, the actor, you remember? Not really. Man. No, you, there was a picture of you. Oh, yeah, they made a joke. They yeah, I know, I know. But Dolph I thought Lundgren, the Hollywood actor. Yeah, no, uh, as the <laughs> producer of a bad movie. But it's true. No, I think uh, maybe yeah. So does it resonate with you? The question to uh, take. Yeah. Does that? Um, um, is you another young German girl? Does it resonate with you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think. Um, I think germ, from what I understand of contemporary German drama, that the questions of, of existential questions of identity are absolutely a major question that, uh, that writers are asking, um, and whether it's about uh, um, who is German in in in, in some, a lot of the sort of post-migrant theater context. In, in this context, it is generational and and it's focused on on. Uh, the individual and technology, who are we in relationship to our, what happens to our relationships when they all become sort of mediated. Um, but I think it's a wonderful observation and yeah, I, I totally buy that thesis. Yeah. I just want to also thank Radek Konopka for doing the sound and video. Yeah. Thanks, Radek. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so um, thank you. I think, yes, theater, I think, is there to create meaning and to tell us where we come from, where we are, and where we are going to. And as I think Anne Bogart famously quoted a Sanskrit text, it also has to entertain the drunk. So um, I think the Gorky plays also um, 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 do that and, um, and make us, uh, 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 you know, at home in the world we live in. And we might say, yeah, she did this. But that has been like this before, it's just a new version and it's okay, we will survive it, but um, it really anticipates in a way a future, but also makes us uh, comfortable with it and say, yeah, it's okay, there are Turkish people on stage and there are people from Israel, they are fighting with someone from Russia, but it's interesting, it's okay, that's not bad. So that's the message for Berlin, a big city, to say, yes, that's exciting, you know, there are problems, but it's... it has some energy in it and I think this is only theater could do that, at least in Berlin, no film, no television series, nothing did that. What that theater did for the kind of vitality in Berlin, at least for the people who engage um, with the arts, and people do know about it. I mean, I was there, and there was like my friend's daughter who was 16, saying to her friend, yeah, should we go to the Gorky or not, or should we see the Fausta? People who kind of uh, normal and not really uh, transferable to here. So it's a fantastic um, 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 theater, and I think I'm happy that we made that decision to um, invite them. I hope you will all join us at the Archive Bar. It's on 36th Street between 5th Avenue and Madison on the south side. It's the uh, closing reception. We had an opening reception and a middle reception. and also <laughs> It's the closing one, but it's a fun. And um, thank you for everybody to make this happen. Again, to Antje Ögel, who helped us, uh, Christopher Faraskula, uh, who had to go back, uh, Jackie, Michael especially, and also 
uh, George, who joined us. So it's always a big, uh, big, big thing for us. We have very, very little team. Uh, we don't even have a theater here at the Siegel. We call it the Siegel Theater, but we have to share it with 30 other programs and 30 centers, and it's rented out. So for us, it was a big deal to be with Panvel Voices, to be with the Gork and have Andy uh, to make such a great play and have you perform it. So um, again, thank you all for coming and uh, check out the Pen Festival that's going on for a couple of more days and come back next year, of course, but also have a look at our ongoing program. Next Thursday, we have a fantastic with Julia Charco, a great New York playwright, actually a teacher of uh, playwriting, and she engaged with a text from Racine, a 17th century writer, and it's about how to stage women's desire. Very interesting. The three significant New York artists, Oakley and others, will come and, uh, and uh, do um, engage with that text. But again, thank you all, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.